Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name's Abby. My name's Amal. And we're your hosts. So every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, or JAS. So this is episode 16, and we chatted with Corel Rowe about their paper, GoFlex, a user-friendly way to calculate GHG fluxes yourself regardless of user experience. And Corel is a PhD student and the creator of GoFlex. Yeah, it was a cool package. I uh, learned a lot about fluxes today and mm -hmm. why they matter. Have, have we had many other climate-related packages? I don't think so, yeah. And GHG is greenhouse gases. Yes, good clarification. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was interesting to hear how they measure that and... I was imagining I could just measure this in my backyard, but no, you'll need some special instrumentation. And these, these static chambers sound really cool, mm -hmm. but it might be as small as something that goes on the surface of a leaf or something that goes over a whole tree. So yeah. that's cool. Lots of science learning and also learning about Carell's story, learning R and mm -hmm. writing software, which is cool. Yeah. And I think it's a common experience we're seeing on this podcast is people without that developer background picking right. up a language to solve their own problems or figure out something. So yeah. it's great to hear. And it is hard when you're the only one sort of figuring things out on your own. Hopefully. Yeah, indeed. And <laughs> you accidentally become the lab's expert software engineer. <laughs> what, that, so that's, yeah, that resonates. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, or you accidentally offend everyone with the package name, which <laughs> I've also, done also that. happened to <laughs> That's definitely well. happened to me. So um, <laughs> there we go. It was a great interview. So uh, yeah, let's jump in. Yeah, let's do it. Corel, so excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Well, so today we're chatting about GoFlux. Can you tell us a little bit about the project and what it is and who it's for? Well, I can start by saying that my supervisors had very long scripts that they had prepared for calculating greenhouse gas fluxes in general. The acronym GHG, by the way, stands for greenhouse gases. So they had these very long scripts in R that they used for calculating these uh, greenhouse gas fluxes. And they were very complicated and very easy to make mistakes every time you have to adapt it for your own data. And so they had these scripts that they've been wanted to turn into an R package for many years. When I started my PhD, I had a fair knowledge in R, so I decided to accept the challenge and make the package for them so that it would be more wrapped up. You can't really make mistakes so much anymore, hopefully. <laughs> nice. And can you tell us what a flux is? What do you mean when you say flux? Yes, of course. So when we mean a gas flux, we mean an exchange of gases between uh, surfaces. A flux is the accumulation of concentration over time. So okay. it's, a, it's the slope, you could say. So here, when I will talk about these fluxes, I generally mean soil fluxes. So it's an exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. So if you think about CO2, for example, in the soil, there's a lot of organisms, microorganisms, or, or even the roots of the plants that respire the same way we do. So they, they have some CO2 coming out uh, of the soil. And so the flux is how much of this CO2 is going into the atmosphere. So now if you take a, a closed compartment and you put it on the surface of the soil, you can measure an accumulation of CO2 inside this closed compartment. So when we talk about static chamber measurement or closed chamber measurement, that's what we mean. We mean uh, a uh, when we put a closed chamber on the soil and measure uh, accumulation of gas inside that chamber. And would that be a big chamber? How big might those be typically? It can vary a lot. Uh, the chamber can be extremely small. It can just be a coffee mug, for example. It can be really small for a very small environment. For example, if you want to measure the surface of a leaf, if the chamber is transparent, at the surface of the leaf, you can measure photosynthesis. So you would measure the uh, CO2 flux that is negative. So the CO2 is going inside the leaf, right? But then if the chamber is dark, then you would measure respiration. So then you can measure positive flux. So you could have a very small chamber to contain a leaf. Uh, but then you could also say, well, if I have a, a big shrub and I want to measure the whole ecosystem respiration around that big shrub, then you would need a very large uh, chamber around uh, a shrub. I know there's been uh, tentative experiments also to create chambers around a whole tree. <laughs> so these chambers can be many meters high, of course. But in that case, it would be a lot easier to use edicovariance towers 
which are these big towers that can measure the, the flux in the entire ecosystem using some very fancy uh, equations. But that's not what my package is about. It's only about these closed chamber measurements. And so when you make a measurement, is that in situ or do you take the chamber away? What actually is the measuring device? What produces the measurements? Yeah, so there's two ways you can do this. The old school fashion uh, method would be to bring your chamber that you put on the ground. And then you have little uh, plastic surface uh, in which you can insert a syringe and then take a gas sample from your chamber. And then you can bring all these gas samples into your lab and then measure the gas concentrations using, for example, a gas chromatograph. The other way that is more novel, and it's only a few years ago, I think, that it's uh, really started, is using these uh, greenhouse gas analyzers. So that's what my package is mostly designed for, if for is for greenhouse gas analyzers. Uh, so these analyzers have a system of tubing that is connected to this chamber and the, the analyzer can uh, measure the concentration of gas every second. So instead of, let's say I put my chamber there for 10 minutes and I take maybe five uh, samples over 10 minutes, the gas analyzer can take a sample every second. And so you can make very short measurements. So that's a very uh, big advantage, but these instruments are of course very expensive and very fragile. <laughs> and so that sounds really cool. I love the title of the paper. It's GoFlux, a user-friendly way to calculate GHG fluxes yourself, regardless of user experience. So it sounds like this might not be possible to do like for myself in my backyard. I'd need to buy a greenhouse gas analyzer. Yeah, or well, you yeah. need to bring your samples uh, <laughs> to a lab where they have a, a gas chromatograph, I guess. But yes, you need to know the gas concentration. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about your background and what brought you to this lab and writing GoFlux? Yeah. My background is microbiology and forest science, so I'm not a programmer or computer geek for that matter. The, f the little bit of our knowledge I had before was just about doing statistics for my master thesis. And so what brought me to write this package, like I mentioned before, was really just because my supervisors had wanted to do this for a while. And so I thought it would be a good challenge for a PhD, of course. <laughs> Were you using this as a way to learn R or get into mm. programming? Or had you done much before? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I saw it as a challenge in the sense that's what a PhD is for. It's <laughs> yeah. like learning opportunities, yeah. you could say. But at the same time, even though I'm, I'm more trained to work in the lab or work in, in the field, yeah, programming sounded like fun. Yeah. Um, and it was super fun. I, I think I really liked it. So I will definitely continue programming it, I think. <laughs> no, it's definitely a useful skill. And it, I'm so glad you did it because it seems like other people have found this package really useful. So great work. Well, I came late to programming as well. I actually learned to program during my PhD. So was your PhD sort of set up around this project and generalizing these tools and techniques? Was that the main focus of your program? Absolutely not. It was really more of a side quest, I think. Okay. And initially it was not supposed to be a whole R package. I, I really didn't think I could do that. So initially it was just supposed to like make small R functions that could do things. And then at some point I thought, what the hell, let's try it. Let's see how difficult it is. And I, I managed to do it fairly fast, surprisingly enough to, to my taste. I mean, it took me a year. Surprisingly fast means <laughs> it took me a year <laughs> of almost working on this full time, but uh, I think it's a it's a pretty good, decent amount of time for, for such a big package and starting with almost no knowledge of how to make an R package to begin with. Nice. Great learning <laughs> experience. From the <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like your first primary audience was uh, your supervisors who asked you to write this, <laughs> but past to them. Who is your target audience for general users of this package? I would say anyone who's doing greenhouse gas chamber measurements and especially inexperienced users. Mm -hmm. So like it says in the title of the package, I think the GoFlux package is student proof. By that, I mean user friendly, of course. Um, I've had a lot of feedback from students from all over the world uh, saying that they had never used R before and they still succeeded in using GoFlux. Uh, because of the very de detailed tutorial that I put on the GoFlux website. 
Nice. So yeah, I would say my, my target audience, it's <laughs> students mostly because I think professors that have been doing uh, greenhouse gas flux measurements, they have their own method mm. and they don't have a tendency of wanting to change their ways. <laughs> <laughs> so I think their students are my main audience, but I've had a very few professors writing to me saying that they've been using it for teaching because yeah, their way, like my supervisors before was this very long script mm -hmm. that you cannot use for teaching because if students don't have a prior knowledge of R, they just don't know what to do with this really big script where the GoFlux package is fairly simple. You can do it in just a few lines of code. So yeah, I've, I've been told that it's great for teaching. So nice. <laughs> students. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think it probably I, helps that you are like learning R yourself. So you had that mm. kind of user base in mind. So you knew how simple it had to be for uh, other students to use. Yeah, exactly. That story of having, you know, the, the people who've been doing it for years have got some like mega script that they just <laughs> run definitely resonate. I know. I think that's a common yeah. story. And then the sort of next generation of researchers are like, Hang on a minute. Maybe there's a better <laughs> way to solve this problem. I was curious. So sounds like some alternatives to GoFlux are the script that your supervisor is already using, but are there other open source tools that people would typically use or commercial packages? What's the general landscape of tools look like in this domain? There are packages available. I think the most commonly used one is the HMR package. And there is also one very popular professional software from the company Lycor that is called Soilflux Pro. And this company Lycor makes also greenhouse gas analyzers themselves. So that's why they have this Soilflux Pro. But surprisingly enough, there's very few of these companies making these greenhouse gas analyzers that have their own software. Last April, I went to a big conference in Vienna called EGU. And a lot of these companies were present. I think six of these companies making these greenhouse gas analyzers were present at the conference. And I went to each and every one of them asking, do you have a software for working with your instruments? Every time they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, we don't. Uh, maybe you can try this and this. And, and they don't know, obviously, that I made one myself. <laughs> and so I just, I had printed this uh, pamphlet for promoting <laughs> my own package out. at the conference. And then, uh, so I come to them and I'm, I made one <laughs> and their reaction was all the same is, so how much money do you want for this? <laughs> they all thought I was asking them to implement their instruments into my already existing software for money. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I'm a PhD student. We, we do everything for free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's academia. We don't make money out of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. So long story short, there's only like, or I think really has a, a software for, for their own instruments. Um, and otherwise it's other R packages, but I will go ahead and say, why is GoFlux better than the alternatives? Please, um, yeah. <laughs> I think, so I have to get a bit technical here. So first I would say that it's because the other softwares are limited to a, a linear method approach. So if you remember what I explained about the fluxes, that it's a concentration accumulation over time. If it was just, uh, like if the, if there was no chamber, no closed environment on the soil, you would have a linear increase of this concentration over time, right? But because we put this chamber, then there's a maximum concentration that can accumulate in the chamber. So that means that over time, you will reach some sort of plateau that you cannot go over this uh, concentration, which would be then the concentration that you find in the soil. So that means that by definition, the greenhouse gas fluxes in chamber measurements are not linear because they have this accumulation. And so one of the limitations, I think, of other softwares, in this case, actually not HMR or Solflux Pro, they both have a nonlinear approach, but other packages, they have, they're limited to the linear approach, which means that you have to select a very short window at the beginning of your measurement that should look approximately linear. But the problem is that the linear method always largely underestimate the true flux. So in that sense, I would say that the GoFlux package is better because it does include a nonlinear approach, which means that we have a measurement that is closer to the true greenhouse gas flux. The second reason is that those packages or software that include the linear approach, the nonlinear approach, they might not have a quality control aspect. So they will use 
a different nonlinear approach. I will not get into details about these uh, equations, but there's many ways you can calculate this nonlinear function, but you need a, a quality control to know the best model fit, because sometimes since it's purely statistics, then your model will always try to fit the data points as best as possible. And sometimes you can get these crazy fit that are statistically good, but biologically it's nonsense. So you need a quality control that will make sure that this nonlinear approach is not going crazy, is not trying to have a statistically good fit, but biologically nonsense. And so in the GoFlux package, I've tried to limit how much the nonlinear function is allowed to curve, is allowed to fit the data points based on the linear flux itself. So if the linear flux has a certain range, then the nonlinear is not allowed to go above that certain range, sort of. So here I would say that's the biggest advantage of the GoFlux is that this quality control function allows for an automatic selection of the best flux estimate that does not require prior knowledge. Yeah, it does not require you to be an expert and know a lot about these fluxes and their behavior because the, the, the function will sort of select it for you. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's so well fitted for students because most likely they haven't seen a million fluxes before. And so they can trust the package will choose the right um, flux. But some professors might <laughs> look at the results and say, oh, no, no, I think here it should have been that one because they have so much more experience. So of course, when you have so much more experience, you can make a better decision than the software. But I think the software is fairly safe at least. Mm -hmm. And finally, one last advantage of the GoFlux over other softwares is simply that there's data pre-processing. So when you extract data from your instruments, in my case, in my lab, for instance, we have many different uh, instruments from many different companies and the data coming out of these instruments is always different. Sometimes you will have a text file, sometimes you have a CSV file, sometimes you have a data file and so on. Um, and so it's always a different way to in import the data into R and then use it with the package. So what I've tried to do is every time I encounter a new instrument, I create a function to import the data into R that fits that function. And then I've uh, also promoted a lot on, on my Twitter and my LinkedIn, that if someone has some data that is not already fit for the package, then they can just send raw data to me and, and then I can create a function for them. I've also created some functions for people who have their own system, because you can sometimes couple different instruments together and then you have something's called a, a multiplexer. So it's a, a computer that will record the data from multiple instruments at one time and merge it together into one multiplexer. And so if they have made that, that computer like homemade, then I can create a function for them to import the data from their own homemade uh, multiplexer. That's an incredible amount of personal support and a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I see why your supervisors had such a long script to start with all of these different variables and experience. Trying Sounds to... like it. Yeah. <laughs> so I did want to ask a bit about the name. So I see that you did change the name from Go Flux Yourself. Do you want to explain that name change a bit? With my supervisors, when we first tried to come up with a name, I suggested the Go Flux and then they had this instant, I don't know, flash of looking <laughs> at me and saying, obviously, <laughs> you're missing something here. Go Flux Yourself. And I thought it was brilliant because it's funny and it's it's catchy and and I just thought it it becomes obviously people know learn about the name so easily just because it's called Go Flux Yourself. But I've had a lot of negative feedback actually uh, from people saying that it was not professional. Even someone from Norway I think told me that he was not allowed to cite my package in his thesis really? because it was uh, against the policy of the university. And so. Yeah, I, I just thought it was such a shame that you're not allowed to use a funny, catchy name just because it might be perceived as unprofessional and offensive. Right. Yeah, being censored is always hard. I am glad that you're making it as accessible as possible through the rename so that more people yeah. can use it. So I think that is yes. good. Never return to me, you miss out on citations through the package <laughs> yeah. name. Yeah, yeah. I agree. That's a bit sad. So. Yeah. yeah. And where does the go part fit in? I'm assuming something with greenhouse gases, but uh, I did assume that this was a go package at first because that is a common that naming. The language, the go language, it's another programming language called go. So they have a lot of packages called like go releaser because this wouldn't apply to your audience if they mostly know R or Python. Yeah. They won't know about go packages. 
No, but I, um, I don't know about go back. Yeah. It's just no. I think it was no. I don't know. It's just catchy. I go really okay. Don't. <laughs> it's nice. There's there's already a, a few uh, other names out there that that are also yeah. They don't really mean anything. It's just of course uh, try to come up with something simple, but it has to have flux in it or something. But yeah. So I wanted to ask about the work you've done in open source more generally. So it sounds like you have picked up programming, especially during your PhD, but like, have you done other work in open source software? Is this the first kind of major thing that you've built in that area? Uh, yes, that was also my first attempt at creating a GitHub. Um, so yes, it's completely my first uh, experience with open source software in general. And well, I mean, I had been able to try and extract things from github before from from other people but uh, again i would say that's one of the the things that uh, really um, encouraged me into making my package user friendly is that just two years ago i was also completely unfamiliar with github and and these kinds of things so yeah it had to be as user friendly as possible but otherwise i mean if it's if we're not talking necessarily about open source software but just open source in general at the university of copenhagen where I'm doing my PhD, it's a requirement, I think, to have open source research in general. And we do try to publish our data, for example. So it is, I think, just a very uh, normal practice in my field in general to have our research open source as, as much as general. And I just thought that the software had to be open source. Yeah. So it was a no brainer for me. It was just normal to, to do it that way. <laughs> yep. Cool. That's great, yeah. You've learned a huge amount in the past couple of years if you were just figuring out GitHub and R at the same time. So it's a yeah. huge accomplishment. So with that in mind, what, what were the biggest challenges you ran into while developing the software? That's a good question. I mean, what is the biggest challenge? I feel like the whole thing was challenging. It's, yeah, I've become a pro at knowing exactly how to formulate my questions on Google so that <laughs> I can get a decent answer. But I would actually say that the, the whole process with GitHub was fairly easy. I think that was quite nice. Mm -hmm. But now I'm actually trying to submit the package to the CRAN. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot more challenging. And they have so many rules that I was not aware of. So I think that that is a big challenge in programming in general is that it's not meant for people like me who have no prior knowledge of programming. I think there's a lot of underlying things that they, they just assume you should know. I think that a lot of times I've been trying to read an answer on Stack Exchange or whatever, and then they use a language that I just don't understand. So I, I think that's the biggest challenge is, sure, I can read these words there in English, but I don't actually know what they mean. So yeah, the whole thing is a big challenge, I think. Yeah. Just like learning Danish in Denmark <laughs> is a big challenge for me right now. Very good. I can imagine. Yeah. And I think that's something we've been hearing on the podcast, especially with self-taught developers. The challenge, the, yeah, just trying to figure things out on yourself. You often don't have a strong community of researchers who write code who can help you out. It's that's growing right. though. Yeah. I would say in my direct environment, I'm definitely the most advanced programmer in my research group. I mean, there's some people who are better than me at statistics, but that doesn't really apply in this case. So I kind of have to rely on myself and learn how to... Yeah, Google. I've tried using ChatGPT a little, but it's not smart enough, I think, to solve these <laughs> issues yet. Maybe if I pay, maybe yeah. it would be better, but the, the free version is not. Yeah, give it another <laughs> year, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to ask a little bit about your experience in Joss. And I realized, actually, I was your editor in Joss, I think. Mm -hmm. So probably Abby should have asked this question and I should leave the room while you answer. But how was it? Was it okay? <laughs> Did you have a good time? <laughs> oh, it was horrible. <laughs> editor was the right asshole. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really nice. Uh, I mean, I've published uh, research papers in, in other journals before, but this was my first experience with the, with the software. And I think it was so fun that we just exchanged uh, in a chat on GitHub. I thought that was really nice. I think also it made the process so much faster. The, the review could go through the package at their own pace and then submit questions whenever they had uh, or well comments. And same for me, I could just once in a while, when I have time, go answer these comments. In, in the normal process, you have to send a review all at once. 
And then when you received a review, you have to send your corrections all at once. And, and that kind of puts some kind of pressure because you have these delays and everything. Where here, sure, you have delays, but you can do it so, uh, gradually. So it, it just felt, I think, a, a lot nicer. I also really appreciated that it was, of course, on, on GitHub. And if I wanted to make some modifications on, on the manuscript itself, the, the, the PDF, I could ask the, the AI to generate a new PDF and then look if my changes were were correct. So again, I think it just made the whole process so much faster and really nice. I, I really loved it. Yeah, I, I promise. Nobody was paid to say this. Carol just said this <laughs> unprompted. I was going to say that thing about the review being iterative and progressing through sort of a conversation is one of my favorite things about the journal. It sometimes doesn't work because either the author or the reviewer really doesn't want to do that. So it, it's mm. one of these things where if the author is just like, okay, I've submitted my paper, I'm going to wait, and then they're going to send me a very long review and I'll deal with that and then I'll be done. You know, they're mm. expecting one iteration with the reviewers and it's not how Joss works. And so sometimes what you like about it is what some people really dislike. Yeah, I can see <laughs> but, that. <laughs> yeah, so especially if they don't use GitHub ever, they then are like getting all these emails every time somebody leaves a comment, they're like, what yeah. is happening? They just like <laughs> get really upset by it. Some people, it's pretty rare. Most people know that it's conversational now. We've been going long enough that it's usually not a surprise, but sometimes it's a surprise. Yeah, to... yeah it was a surprise to me, but it was fun anyways. Yeah, good, I it. good. Pleased to hear it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's good. So, Karel, I did see on your Twitter and also in the photo that you submit to us, you are expecting. So, congratulations. Thank you. And so, this is coming from someone who started a podcast while on parental leave right now. But I do hope you're able to take some time off after you have your baby. But are you open to any sort of contributions, maybe for when you return or for while you're out? While I'm out, I definitely expect my supervisors to take over. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I really hope from them that they can learn GitHub uh, right before I leave because, yeah, they don't know how that whole thing works. But uh, I would say otherwise, from anyone using the software, that I'm always open to receiving raw data. If, if their instrument is not uh, already on uh, the package, then I would love to create a new function for them. So I've, I've been doing that continuously ever since I, I started the package. And otherwise, I mean, it's uh, very typical if you know anything about GitHub, you just submit an issue saying, I would like you to add this feature or something like that. And yeah, I think that's essentially it for, for, for contributions is, is to send it as an issue through GitHub or uh, to, to me personally as an email uh, on the GoFlux webpage. There is my uh, contact information there, so I, I would love to receive uh, people's ideas of what should be added to the package or, or their data. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, and we'll include that in the show notes, so if anyone listening wants to reach out. Excellent. All right, so I think you mentioned that you're in the process of submitting to CRAN, so that sounds like a lot of work. Sorry, that sounded harsh about CRAN. I, CRAN's amazing, <laughs> but good luck. It's a, it's a lot of work. I know. Uh, good luck submitting to CRAN. What else is happening? How can people stay up to date with your work going forward? Are there any places you want people to follow you online? So like I mentioned earlier, um, my, my sole focus is not uh, programming. So I, I do have other research going on and I, I do try to post about it on uh, X in, link in LinkedIn. And otherwise, if they just want to get updates on the package itself, it can either be through GitHub or uh, the GoFlux webpage that I've mentioned a couple of times. And otherwise, with my supervisors, we're also very much open to conversations about how to handle these greenhouse gas fluxes calculations and what, what should be the best uh, guidelines, you could say, because there are guidelines on the best practices for any covariant uh, greenhouse gas fluxes, for example, but there's not really any guidelines for uh, static chamber measurements. So people just do how they feel like, and everybody has their own uh, mindset on, on how it should be done. Not saying that anybody's wrong or right or anything, it's just there's no really consensus, that's all. Uh, so with my supervisors, uh, we thought it would be amazing if we could open a conversation with people who have been working with greenhouse gas fluxes for a while and have an opinion on how these uh, calculations should be done. 
our goal in that is obviously to improve GoFlux so that it fits everybody's needs. Because for now, we've adapted it to our needs and, and the way we think is best. But if some other people think that, oh, no, this, this package is not good because it's not my way of thinking, then uh, it defeats the whole purpose of making it uh, user-friendly for, for students uh, if your supervisor doesn't agree with, with my supervisor, for instance. So, of course, I'm open to discussions on if there are other ways. And on that, I would like to mention that at the EGU conference in Vienna in 2025, we would like to organize a session on greenhouse gas methods in general. So not just uh, calculations, but also how to measure with chamber measurements or, or eddy covariance for towers and so on. So, so methods in general for greenhouse gas fluxes. Um, so anybody who's uh, watching this podcast, of course, uh, just so you know about EGU, we would like to invite you to our session if you want to present something or just know more about these methods. Awesome. And they can email you, I guess? Yeah, of to, course. Yeah. yeah. Great. great. It sounds like you're doing a bunch of work mm -hmm. organizing, trying to organize the community and really drive some shared thinking here. I do think that's one of the things open source is really good at with driving a standard. So I'm glad you're making this as easy for people to adopt as possible, because then once you have that critical mass, that standard of how you analyze that data really disseminates among the, the communities. Hey, Carol, it's been really fun talking to you today <laughs> and learning about greenhouse gases and fluxes and all of your work. It's been lovely to talk to you and I wanted to thank you again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. And congrats. Yes, congrats <laughs> and good luck. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arthur Smith and me, Abby Kubernak-Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Fox Cat.